I am really glad you're here today because you may have had this thing happen to you with your marketing or your content where you're like, I need to show up and I need to be professional and I need to be authentic and I need to make sure I include everybody. And you might not know how the F to do that. And you might be feeling like, what does it even mean to be professional? What if I don't show up with makeup on? What if I don't show up with my hair done? What if I don't show up with the most perfect outfit? What if I say something wrong? These are some of the reasons that it is really hard for women to show up in social media, to show up in marketing, whatever they're doing, especially that we are being seen on video so much these days, right? And so today I'm really excited to introduce to you an expert in the field of anti-racism and leadership. And her name is Alyssa Hall. And Alyssa is an African-American Cuban woman. And I worked with her personally in her program last year. And I knew the entire time I was working with her that I really wanted to have this conversation on my podcast. And so we have, are, we're gonna talk about so much amazing, true, honest, no bullshit stuff. I'm gonna let her talk to you about who she is and her expertise, but Alyssa, I hope that that introduction did a little bit of justice to all of the, the work that you do and how much you helped me personally in my growth in trying to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable business as a leader. So thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And you know, as Jen mentioned, um, a lot of my work really stems in anti-racism and leadership and how both of those two things mesh together. And marketing and more so inclusive marketing and like what Jen mentioned, you know, being authentic. It's a really interesting thing that I feel like people don't realize falls into that bubble when we're trying to understand what does it mean to have an anti-racist business or an anti-racist space. Um, there's a lot of internal mindset stuff that we have to get through in order to make our spaces um, diverse and safe and inclusive. So I'm just, I'm really excited for the conversation today. Yeah. I, I mean, part of me wants to ask you why it's so important to have a diverse and inclusive business, but I feel like in 2022, we shouldn't be having to have that, that, that question <laughs> answered. And I also feel like if you're listening to this podcast and you feel like, oh, we're talking about anti-racism today, so I'm going to click off, then this isn't the podcast for you anyway. So, but, but can you just talk about like, why, why, why is this, Talk about the, the why behind your work. Yes. Um, the main way that I think about my work is that a lot of us as business owners, um, when we think of the mission of our business, or even it doesn't even have to be that grand, right? It could even just think about who it is that we want to serve. We're thinking about the transformation that we want them to have. We think about um, the way that we want our work to affect their lives and what my work does is it expands who we're talking about. You know, the way that we have been brought up in this society is to specifically look at white people as the default, everyone else as other. And so therefore everyone has to come in and fit into our mold in order to do whatever it is that they need to do. And the way that I do my work is sort of expanding that so that there is no other, there is no default. It's about bringing people in, in an actual inclusive way, not just including them because they're here, but including them in a way that is making sure that they feel psychologically safe, making sure that they're feeling heard and listened to. Um, that, that was like a bunch of different levels, but I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about when people meet you for the first time or they seek you out for the first time? What are they struggling with in terms of creating inclusivity in their marketing and their content? Yeah, the, the big thing is, is how. So many people are just like, okay, but how <laughs> do I question? Do <laughs> <Just a> question. <laughs> yes. And a lot of times it's like, oh, can we just do like a one-off session about, and you tell me how, or can, do you have a workshop and you can tell me how? And it's like, there are so many things that are, involved in this conversation and it all comes from a good space it's all from like I want to make sure that people know that I care that people know that I'm a safe space and we first need to always break down what even is the safe space do you actually have a safe space or do you want to have a safe space um 
what are even the intentions behind the work too? There's so much stuff that gets broken down, but the main reason why people come is like, okay, but how, please tell me how I'm lost. I'm confused. And I want to do this. I just don't know where to start. Right. I want to be inclusive. I want to have an anti-racist business. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, so tell me how. And when I started working in your program last year, which I can't believe was last May, um, the, uh, the, the, the hows, you can't get to the hows until you break down a whole bunch of these foundational things. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So when we say inclusive business, what are we, when we say inclusive marketing, when we say inclusive content, what is, what comes to mind for you? What comes to mind, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm remembering specifically in our cohort, when we first started talking about what does inclusivity mean? Um, I use this example that I did not create that, um, my mind is blanking. Thank God for editors. Hold on while I get, <laughs> name. my God, how I'm like, I know it, um, no, it begins with a T. Trudy LeBron, Jesus Christ. Okay, I'll say the whole sentence. <laughs> <over again. laughs> um, there was an example that Trudy LeBron created, and I use it all the time whenever I describe inclusivity, where she talks about um, when you invite a vegan to a barbecue, and mm -hmm. if they come and there is no food that they can actually eat, are you being inclusive or are you just looking at diversity and mm. inclusivity would be acknowledging the fact that when they get there, they have to eat just like everyone else is able to eat. So how, what can we change to make sure that they are getting the exact same um, experience as everyone else? And they're not going home with a migraine. They're not uh, now having to buy food after the barbecue and feeling like they have to be silent and not say anything just so that they can continue to feel quote unquote included. Um, and when we spoke about it in our cohort, I remember we were talking about like gluten free and like all of these other things. And what's amazing about inclusivity is that that one change for that one specific person, a lot of times can support other people as well without us realizing it. So what, it, what, what does this look like in our marketing content? How do we mm. be more inclusive without, well, without pandering, without, um, uh, without getting canceled, right? Without saying the wrong thing. Cause I mean, this is what white people are afraid of. Right. Um, how do we, how do we be inclusive and be honest so that people of color who don't look like me, right? Like this was a big thing. This was why I joined your, your program. I wanted to know as a yeah. white woman who had looked around at all of her marketing was like, holy shit, I've only been talking to white people, right? Like I've, yeah. I only know white people. How can I learn more about this? And you created a really incredible space for us to unpack all of this stuff. And I learned a ton about inclusive marketing, which is why I'm having you here. But like for our listeners, mm -hmm. what the hell does that look like? Yes. And I love that you use like specific words to like without pandering, because I feel like on the like, this is a very fine line between pandering and being super, super weird. And <laughs> like, <laughs> I know you know what I'm talking about, because it's just, yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> yeah, compared to actually speaking to people. And this is where I feel like you and I uh, connected, Jen, in terms of the way that we think about marketing. The way that I talk about it is like, are you speaking to people like in their soul? Are they feeling like, mm. oh, you really understand me and all the different facets of things that come with me to this issue? So um, an example that I like to use is if we have a business and it's about having people feel more confident showing up on live, right? And we're just talking about the lack of confidence piece and we're not acknowledging um, even just, I'm thinking about even like women, right? Um, you mentioned something at the, the top of the episode of like um, a woman who decides to not wear makeup, a woman who's like, oh, is my hair perfectly done? These are additional layers that society yes. has created norms for. And if we're not addressing that and we're just talking about you just lack confidence, let's strengthen up that confidence, 
then we're not acknowledging the full gamut of what's going on in having that person show up on live or whatever problem we're solving. No, it's a great point because when we're, when we're creating marketing, we often create it from our set of strengths, right? So if you're great mm -hmm. on video and you are confident on video and you create on video in your marketing, and I'm not even talking about the words that you're using, like just the, the, the platform that you're using. Now you're kind of saying to the other people um, who prefer listening or who prefer reading, you're like, this is how I'm creating content. So you're kind of like, oh, it's a whole bunch of people I'm not going to reach. That's just an example mm -hmm. of how like, that is a non-inclusive way. And again, I'm not like we're, right. you and I aren't even talking about black and white here. We're talking about human to human or the way that like our different brain styles work even. And so one of the things that I took away from our experience in your group was inclusivity is not just the black white version of it. It is oh, we have to think about people's, their learning styles, their listening styles, their, their, the way that they like to consume. How long can it be? How short can it be? Like, And one of the big takeaways was, oh, inclusivity requires intention. Inclusivity requires you to think about how might this be received by somebody else? Yes. Oh my, and that's like, honestly, my favorite piece of inclusivity work is we, a lot of people come to me obviously for anti-racism, but yeah. we can really open up the space into what it is that we're actually talking about. Um, I had a client the other day who was like, I changed the length of my videos in my course, or I made the length of the videos in my course to be like 15, 20 minutes because my audience are people who also have another job while they're trying to create this business. And I know all I had at the end of the day was 20 minutes. So I'm not going to make these hour long videos. That's yes. another deeper layer of really being intentional for the people that we want to serve. Yeah, I love that. So when we're talking about intentionality and inclusivity, what are some of the things that people get really confused about? What, what, what are the stumbling blocks when they are trying to get, because people want to be intentional. They want to ultimately serve as many people as possible. They want to be inclusive, but especially white people, we're like, oh my God, we don't know. And we don't want to screw up. Right. Like, so yes. what are some of the stumbling blocks that we can, you can help us identify and then maybe move through? Yes. So some, two of the biggest, uh, like they're not even stumbling blocks. They're like roadblocks is <laughs> <laughs> One of them is exactly what you said, this deep fear of being wrong and compared to saying, mm, I know I'm going to mess up eventually. Mm -hmm. And I also know that this is not a function of my personality. If mm -hmm. I mess up in this way. We have mm -hmm. been in this society and been raised by this binary, right? Where it's like, oh, if you like, I'm thinking about in school, if you raise your hand and you get the answer wrong, it's not, oh, she did the math wrong. It's, oh, she's dumb. Right. Like she's an idiot. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Right. And like bringing that to this work, it's that same exact thing. What happened when, like me in school, I would just not even raise my hand. I knew all the answers, but I had to double, triple, quadruple check in my head and someone else would say the answer. And then I'd be mad at myself for not raising my mm -hmm. hand. It's the same thing here. So when we're so afraid of being wrong, it's not only about what it says about us. A lot of times it's about, I don't want to harm someone else. And yes even thinking about what is it that harms someone else a, nine times out of 10 with what I've noticed it's like not only the initial harm but then what happens afterwards is really where that big piece oh, of harm happens like the like a defensiveness or a, or shutting down mm -hmm. of a group or like an ignoring like all of those kinds of responses rather than um taking ownership of it or like I could have done better or teach me I, I need to learn better that kind of thing Yes. Yes. Gotcha. And I have really just been, um, just happy for humanity and like the best way that I could say that, um, as we're recording this, this was like a few days after the incident at the Oscars. Right. And so a lot of people have been making, uh, like think pieces or whatever about what has happened. 
But even more importantly, what I have seen, especially on LinkedIn is like, um, I'll just be scrolling. And then the first chunk of this post is saying like, edited to add, um, this group of people have told me that what I've said is, is um, insensitive, mm. it, it has racist undertones, blah, blah, blah. I've also been told to leave the post up so that it can serve as a learning tool. All of these things, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> okay. That's Right. That's huge compared to what our typical defense is when we're so afraid is we will delete the thing. We will run yeah. away. Some people double down, like all of those things cause way more harm than what I've been seeing now. Does that make sense? So it's kind of, it does because it's like, um, permission, a shift you're seeing is permission to be in progress rather than permission or, or, or like expecting yourself to be perfect. Oof. And if you expect yourself yes. to be perfect in your marketing, you're going to screw it up. It's like, you're going to be paralyzed because you're going to screw it up at some point. And so you're hiding yourself. If you're not giving yourself permission to be in progress, like you're seeing. Yes. Oh my gosh. You know what you saying that is reminding me of like, um, whenever, at least for myself, whenever at the beginning I would write marketing in general, I'd be like, this is the one post that has to make me money. <laughs> right. So you're trying for this post to be perfect. And then you're not even letting yourself get the damn post out. And then it just, it never comes out compared to this post is a part of a process. It is a part of progress. Mm -hmm. It allows you to do things and learn from them and do better. I like that a lot. And that is just like, oh, we can take a collective breath because mm -hmm. on our way to inclusivity, we have to be gentle with ourselves. We have to know, especially white, us white people, we have to know we are learning. We have not lived this experience. We're going to bump up against ourselves. We're going to bump up against other things. We're going to be judged, right? We're going to be called in. We're going to be called out. And if we are not willing to do that journey, then there's a whole bunch of people that we can't really call in to work with us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's a lot of people. Like when I think of it, I'm like, that's a lot of people that are just not able to feel safe and comfortable in the space. And what I've noticed too, is sometimes there are people who have like already diverse clientele, but are they feeling psychologically safe enough to bring up all the different layers of what's actually going on or are they only bringing up this small micro thing and not everything else that comes with it it's because there's a lot it's very nuanced I mean I right. learned that in your in your in your group so I think this is a great place to kind of pivot to talk about um, okay inclusivity is obviously important we've talked about ways to think about inclusivity and to try to um experiment with it and to uh, be gentle with ourselves as we do it. Um, a lot of this requires us to be, and I'm putting air quotes around this, authentic, right? <laughs> and so now we need to deal with this hateful word that we're all like, what the F does it mean to be authentic at this point, right? Like in an Instagram world, in an Instagram reels world, what the hell does it mean to be authentic? What are your thoughts on this? Oh my gosh. I love how you even brought up like in an Instagram reels world, because literally all Instagram reels is at this moment is just, we're all doing this little performance. <laughs> we just, we move on. I'm over it. <laughs> I know. And pre that, I feel like when we were talking about authenticity, um, it was like vulnerability and like, triggering vulnerability. Like I, there have been, especially in the coaching industry, there have been so many people's life stories that I did not need to read about. And <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't need to know that people. It's okay. I don't need to know that. I love that. It is. And it's just been odd. And that has been, oh, I'm being authentic. And it's like, no, you're, you're giving us your trauma. And at the end of it, you're talking about how your program teaches certain tools, <laughs> just very different compared to being your full self, meaning like letting your personality shine, right? And 
it's hard, especially as women for us to do that, but especially even more if building this business is a career change for you. And you've been in some type of industry, especially corporate, where you have to like, you have to put on the suit, you have to do the thing. And that is what we've defined as professional compared to now doing the mindset work of redefining professional so that you allow yourself to show your full personality and what you're doing. You talk a little bit about how specifically as a woman of color, this bullshit of authenticity affects people of color. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was, I don't remember where I saw it, but essentially when it comes to women of color being authentic, it's like, be authentic as long as you still fit what is comfortable for us. If you are outside of what's comfortable for us, then please mold yourself into this. And so jumping back to like what we were taught as authentic before, even like not taught, but what we've seen online as authentic before, like the sharing of the trauma stories, the, um, the, the stretch mark stuff, the, the breastfeeding stuff, all of these, like, and not that they're bad, <laughs> like, but it's more so like, again, it's, it's more so vulnerability compared to authenticity. And for me, authenticity is showing up in a way that feels like me, whether that be today, I don't have on my nails, but usually I have on like these like long, crazy, fun nails. I noticed. And- I noticed you didn't have them on today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, she doesn't feel like it today. Right. She doesn't feel like it. In the middle of packing. And I'm like, I don't want to worry about nails. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I really like, I make it a point to show up as my full self because I know other people don't have that luxury to do that. Mm -hmm. And I want to always actively almost break down for people. What does professional look like? Even now, like for the last um, 10 months or so, I've been wearing my, my hair natural. This was not a conscious decision, but here we are 10 months later and we're still doing Mm -hmm. it. And even understanding, like reshaping my own thoughts about that, about like, okay, what am I defining as professional? What am I defining as looking, uh, up kept or whatever? Um, and these are all the different types of mental gymnastics that women of color have to deal with compared to, um, for a white woman, a messy bun has now been, that's, that's okay. Normalized, right? It's normalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there's just all of these extra layers that I imagine, you know, as a white woman, I know how exhausting all the bullshit is of running a business and marketing yourself and also trying to have a life and, oh, keep up your relationship. And, oh yeah, I'm a mom too, (laughs) right? Like all of this is just exhausting, but you're just saying there's um, additional layers that we need to consider in order to be inclusive and try to be authentic. And it just can take a lot out of us. Right, right. Like I'm, I'm even thinking about like, what are cultural norms that have long since been seen as, in, not inappropriate, but unprofessional that mm-hmm. we may want to be able to express in what we're doing. And how does that now affect us again from showing up authentic when mm-hmm. only a certain part of us is allowed to be shown in this authenticity conversation. So let's move into the idea about professionalism, because I think these are kind of these things like really uh, are seamless, uh, like a spectrum of things we need to consider. Um, Mm -hmm. What, what does professional, what did it mean to you before you really started kind of embracing this work that you're doing? Like, what is the white version of being professional? mean? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, it's very interesting, mainly because of the, uh, professional background that I came from before doing this. Um, I was a, I was in the restaurant industry for, I don't remember how many years now at this point, all these years are melting together. Um, but I was in there for a very long time. And I remember, um, one time either going to a job interview or being at a job and someone saying that, um, if a woman shows up to a job interview without makeup, then that means that she doesn't care about the job. 
And I'm just like, I, and I am someone who has never really liked makeup. And so that was always something that resonated with me. Um, so like I said, showing up with full on face of makeup, um, making sure that um, even the tone in the way that I'm speaking is uh, more palatable, I guess, um, the way that I'm dressing, right? Uh, making sure that it is like you can't really see much of anything like I have always had like natural curves so making sure that those curves you cannot see them in whatever it is that I'm wearing um, and a lot of dark colors I'm, I'm realizing this now like there was just so much dark clothing um, and it's just what what is it business casual like but even like when i see people talk about business casual now i'm like damn y'all are wearing some cute stuff what what is happening <laughs> compared to like like the peplum tops and the, the the black slacks and like it was just very much like you have to put on this costume yes. in order to be able to go to work so it was like boring business boring right like mm -hmm. um you know, and professional means tamping down who you are so that you can fit in. Exactly. Exactly. Um, a lot of the places that I would work, I would usually be the youngest person there until I entered like more so. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Aside from being in the restaurant industry, I was also like doing receptionist stuff here and there. So when I was in the receptionist jobs I was typically the youngest person there so even more so like dampering down my personality the things that I found fun and interesting I could not bring that in there either it was oh, it's just a, a very strange thing now that I think about it being so removed compared to like how I exist in professionalism now it's just like wow of course if you're in this space for so long it was it's normalized. Be, yeah. It's so normalized. Yeah. Yeah. If you, so I just want to say thank you for um, unpacking a lot of the stuff. And I, I feel like we have not even barely touched the surface of the iceberg, right? The top of the iceberg. If, if somebody is like thinking, okay, I get inclusivity and I get authenticity. Let's not bleed all over the internet. And I get that I get to create my own version of professionalism and what are a couple of big takeaways or, or like, or even little shifts that we can start to do to weave this work into our content and our marketing and how we run our businesses? Yeah, I think one of the very big things for me is uh, noticing what are some of the like qualifiers that you're telling yourself are required mm -hmm. for people to take you seriously. That's, that's how I translated it when Ooh, I was like coming into that. this work, I was like, that's great. Oh, well, in order for people to take me seriously, I have to do blah, 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 blah. All the things that I listed. Um, right. and really challenge that. Does that have to do with your, your, the content that you're sharing, the expertise that I know that you have, or else you wouldn't be doing any of this stuff that you're doing. Um, yeah. Really starting to channel, really starting to challenge a lot of the internalized um, societal messaging that we have for ourselves first. So then we can really broaden the way that we're seeing other people and creating more inclusive spaces. You know, there's a coach that I used to listen to and watch and everything around her was incredibly pristine white. And every single video she did was at this desk and everything around her was in the perfect place. And she always had the perfect outfit. She had the perfect hair and she had the perfect nails. And it, it uh, this was at the beginning of my journey into coaching. And I was like, oh, that's what coaches look like. Oh, that's mm -hmm. how I should be. And I, I'm just not that way. Like I'm kind of messy and I... I, I like to travel. So right now I'm in like the bedroom at my parents' house in Charlotte, North Carolina. Like I just don't, I mean, I think I have my shit together pretty well, but I don't have my shit together to the nth degree. Right. And most of us don't. And so if, if I, a woman of privilege am thinking like, oh, I need to even step it up. 
how do people who have been like struggling with way more shit than I could ever even freaking imagine, Mm -hmm. what are, what, like, what rungs on the ladder are they trying to climb? And that's, I think, just things that we need to start thinking about so that we can meet everybody where they are and, and include them right via our content and marketing. Yes. Yes. And even thinking about how that holds people back. That's all I was thinking about when you were saying that of just like, when we have these shoulds and we don't check them, how often are you holding yourself back? Yes. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, and I remember her even talking about the store that she shopped in and I was like, oh, maybe I should shop at that store. And it's like, what's the matter with me? (laughs) How can I show up and be my, how can, if I'm not even going to be myself in my marketing, how can anybody trust me to come into my programs? Right. That's the big thing. And I feel like when people ask like, why does authentic, why does authenticity even a part of the conversation of anti-racism? That's it. We need to just know who you are as a, as a fundamental human in order to trust you with what's going on with us. And we need, until we break that down as to why that's important, especially for a lot of us who work with people one-on-one, trust is huge. Yes. And it doesn't come quickly or easily. And so Mm -hmm. on this journey, it is really bumpy and it is uncomfortable and uh, you need a safe space for yourself. It, uh, you know, as you're learning as a white person to become more inclusive in your marketing and your content. The other thing, I just want to touch on this briefly. We, we have been talking a lot about content and marketing, but then when people get inside your program, they also need to be made sure that there is safety and inclusivity there. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think this is, again, another thing that gets missed because when we think of anti-racism, we're thinking of like the outside stuff, like the people that are coming in, are we talking to the people? But like you said, once they get in, has that space been curated for them to thrive just like everyone else that is in there? That's the big, big thing that um, I think a lot of us miss. And when it comes to creating that safe space, it's... um, when we have like a community involved, have we really done that internal leadership work to be able to ensure the safety of that community? We can't necessarily um, force people to think a certain way or change people's minds about things, especially if it literally has nothing to do with the work that you're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. But what we can do is show up as a leader in moments where it's necessary. We can also curate the space in terms of what we're talking about, right? So if we're going to be talking about like the example that I use, like, oh, showing up on live and the confidence to do that, are we also talking about the reasons why it may be difficult for certain people to feel that confidence? What barriers do they have to cross? Like for women, we we spoke about that. and then the, the intersectionality piece, okay, for women of color, what does that look like? For trans yeah. women, what does that look like, yeah. right? Yeah. And are we talking about that in our program or are we just waiting for someone else to bring it up, hopefully? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are certain ways that we can create that inclusivity and safety within the work that, within the programs that we've created. Yeah. I just want to um, make it really clear. How can people follow you to start to learn more about everything we've been talking about? Where's the best channels for you? Yeah, the the best way to follow me is on Instagram at AR Leadership. Um, I've started hanging out on LinkedIn as well, Um, but I have a really plain Jane name. You're not going to find me just from the names. (laughs) (laughs) I'll put the link to your LinkedIn in our show notes then. Perfect. That yes. way, because because LinkedIn does not make it easy to find people. They're like, it's Alyssa Dash Hall Dash Five Five Six. And blah, 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 blah. Like, thanks, LinkedIn. We couldn't have done this a little bit easier. Seriously. Yes. <laughs> it's it reminds me of like the old MySpace uh, handles. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> and then if people want to find out how to work with you, um, just go to AlyssaHallCoaching.com. Yes, everything they need all is there. of yep, every single thing is there. 
I have a question. Do you still offer that private podcast about your anti-racist um, and inclusivity coaching? Yes, I I do. I still have that private podcast and there are, I think like 16 or so episodes, episodes. of just yeah. anti-racism and it's, it's really, really packed. So yeah, I'd recommend that. And that's how I found you first back in the day when it got shared with me. Like, who knows who shared it with me, but I really want to share it with my audience. Can people get that at alyssahallcoaching.com? Is there an opt-in there for that? Yes, it's at the very, very tippity top of the page. And it's, yeah. the, the lettering is quite small, but it is there. Okay, okay. Um, as a content coach, I would say, make that bigger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and make that bigger. But mostly I wanna say thank you so much for all of the gems that you dropped today. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that I should have asked? <laughs> I feel like, this was a really good entry point for a lot of people to start just percolating in their brain of like, oh, let me shift the way that I've been looking at anti-racism work and inclusivity and my part in that um, yeah. compared to, I feel like honing in on the diversity piece and not really mm -hmm. seeing all the things that lead up to that. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I really, if you are listening today, I want to say thanks for joining us. Thanks for staying to the end. It's a great topic. It's an important topic. Go check out Alyssa. You'll learn a lot from her and she is so accessible. Um, and I just really appreciate the work that I did with her. So thanks again, Alyssa. I appreciate you. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Bye.